People around the world are going online to stay in touch and work during the coronavirus pandemic. This has become necessary because of physical distancing protocols that have been put in place globally to prevent the spread of the disease. That's right, Priscilla. Now, from schools setting coursework online to office staff working from home, the internet is the answer to many coronavirus lockdown problems. But what about the millions of people who can't get online? Welcome to today's show, where we shall be looking at the challenges of staying connected in Africa during a global pandemic. I'm Ian Ofula. And I'm Priscilla Nyether. The coronavirus pandemic has exposed glaring inequalities in internet access, connectivity and the cost of internet. Let's take a look at some of the numbers. Right, now globally only just over half of households, which is 55% uh, have internet connection and this is according to UNESCO. Meanwhile, in developed world, that is at about 87% are connected. This is quite high, could almost be double as compared to developing nations where just 47% are connected to the internet and just 19% in the least developed countries, Priscilla. And if you do have internet connection, the next challenge you face is the cost. In sub-Saharan Africa, one gigabyte of data costs nearly 40% of the average monthly earnings. According to the World Bank, 85% of Africans live on, on less than $5.50 a day. As a result, steady internet remains out of reach for many, many Africans. That's right. Now, we'd like to know the kind of challenges you're facing right now trying to earn a living. And of course, this is with limited connectivity. Is this even a priority? for you or are you focused on other things do let us know in the comment section and we shall be uh, looking at what you're telling us now to help us unpack this today we have Papa Yusuf Anjai who's the founder and CEO of Unique Group in the Gambia and Elsie Kanza the head uh, of the regional agenda at the World Economic Forum thank you for joining us Elsie and uh, Papa maybe Priscilla you can take over the first question uh, so that we Go on with this. Yes, Dr. Kanza, we'll start with you. Working from home has become a global solution to crisis we're facing right now. But with people in Africa either not having internet access or facing high costs, how does this play out right now? Uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, a very important question, a very big concern. Uh, what we've seen happen globally is that during the COVID crisis, uh, the pressure on digital networks has grown exponentially up to between 200 and 300% 300 in terms of, of the demands on existing networks. And uh, we also know that about half, uh, well, 50% or so of the world's population is, is completely un unconnected. So this prompted um, uh, a renewed call for action uh, in collaboration with GSMA and, and ITU. Uh, the World Economic Forum published uh, a set of recommendations, short term and medium term, uh, which is shared with over 170 countries. These are measures that can be undertaken uh, by ICT and, and finance ministers as well as regulators uh, to enable as many people as possible uh, to be connected during this period, whether it's for access to coronavirus information um, or access to educational facilities. There we've seen innovations and solutions uh, from telcos, for instance, that are zero rating access to uh, data costs uh, for coronavirus related information, um, for educational sort of e-learning needs as well. So there's a renewed effort. The problem is very real and, uh, and hopefully we'll see uh, measures that have been underway accelerated. Mm. Dr. Kanza, could you share some of the recommendations that were put in place, well put forward? Well, in, in essence, uh, if I build on the work that uh, we've had underway in Africa since 2016 about how we close uh, the, the connectivity gap, uh, think about it in, in four critical areas. One is access, uh, just infrastructure, um, and there are innovative solutions uh, to that. We also have universal service access fees that can be deployed um, to encourage the adoption of innovations by entrepreneurs and, and, and larger operators. Um, the second is with respect to affordability, so uh, taxes, uh, for instance, and having finance ministers uh, lift taxes already makes access uh, much more affordable um, in many cases, um, as well as the measures I, I shared, for instance, uh, zero rating access to data for critical services. The third aspect is relevant content. Um, again, uh, with the coronavirus, the content is very relevant and people need it. And so they're willing um, to go on 
to the internet where they have access and it is affordable. If the content is not relevant, uh, they will not use it. And, and the last aspect is skills. And, and here, really uh, commend those who are coming up with uh, solutions uh, to also bridge the digital literacy gap. For instance, one of the forum's partners, Coursera, has made about uh, over 3,000 uh, modules free um, during this uh, corona crisis through partnerships with various governments, including in Africa. Now, thank you, Dr. Elsie, for that. Let me bring in Yusufa. Uh, being an internet service provider, how do you think Africa has fared on, especially during this time when connectivity is key and everyone is sort of being asked to stay at home? Thank you for having me. I mean, it's a very uh, interesting question uh, that we get asked all the time. How are we coping with the kind of demand that the present situation presents us? Uh, um, I can tell you that over the past 10 to 15 years, a lot has improved in terms of infrastructure in Africa. I mean, this Skype call would not have been possible probably a few years ago. Uh, so you have an explosion of um, submarine cables bringing in much needed connectivity in our part of the world. Of course, your question is, how, how, how have we been coping over the past couple of months? And my answer to you is we've been coping very well. Uh, of course, customers do still complain about the cost of connectivity, but at the end of the day, networks are keeping up, the demand is there, we're being kept busy, and at the end of the day, it has become a way of life that people cannot but use the internet as we speak. Of course, we've seen a number of trends. We've seen a number of trends uh, during this period. We've seen how customers have really used the internet um, innovatively because most businesses yes. are closed. In the, Gamb in the Gambia, for example, um, we have a lockdown. I mean, the public emergency has just been extended, as I'm speaking to you, for another 21 days. So you can imagine what that has meant for uh, people in the restaurant industry, in the hospitality industry, uh, uh, tailors sewing, sewing African fabrics. So we've got customers at the end of the day who are using our connectivity to make sure that their customers uh, send them orders uh, through WhatsApp, for example. I, I have a lot of schools on my network okay. uh, who are used to Google Meets and Google Classrooms, things of that sort. So the pressure is on, but we're definitely coping. Well, uh, Yusufa, when you say we are still coping and you look at the figures, we're looking at in some areas connectivity of about 47% and in other countries in, across the continent as low as 19%. So as a player in this particular field, does this concern you? Oh, yes, it, 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 it certainly concerns us. I, I, I don't want to get too technical, but we all understand the challenges of running uh, internet services in our continent. Uh, I, I want to mention one or two. The infrastructure challenges are there. Mm -hmm. What you currently have is uh, operators being, for example, in Nigeria, uh, you have the right of way where the state will charge you pretty much half of the cost of, the, uh, of, of your budgets to basically put out uh, infrastructure. So, so we, we are saying that uh, some of these numbers are there because of uh, government policies, uh, infrastructure is not being shared among operators. You know, the fiber docks and all of these things are not being shared. Everybody wants to put up their own towers. So we need to see a harmonization of operators working together, of course, with strong regulators that can bring these things together. I also want to believe that the, the government also has an important role, apart from promoting con competition, getting rid of monopolies, regulation. I think public Wi-Fi is a fantastic way, and we've seen that in our part of the world during this pandemic. I mean, I have a, a young entrepreneur who pretty much buys bandwidth and resells it at like $2.50 for the whole week for people to connect up to 10 megabits per second. So at the end of the day, people are finding ingenious ways of getting people connected to, to make sure that penetration rates increase and, and, and cost this decrease. And of course, mobile broadband is, is most common in Africa. We do not have these fixed wireless or fixed fiber networks. But I think that's where we need to move because in the rest of the world, you know, most of these things are, are, are at home and mobile broadband is a lot more expensive to deploy than, 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 than fixed wireless. So, so we're hoping that uh, an increment in, 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 in fixed uh, broadband can, can change some of the numbers uh, you're talking about. But clearly the challenges are there. Mm -hmm. uh, satellite, satellite internet also 
is coming back because we've seen that it's a bit more expensive, but in areas but, where you okay. can traditional broadband. Thank you. Right now, we're, we're going to have a mm -hmm. look at what some people in, um, on Facebook are saying. So please, if you're watching on Facebook, keep bringing in your comments. Earlier on, we had a comment from Dominic Anailuo. He is in uh, South Sudan. He, uh, he says, the issue of internet is very big problem that we experience in terms of cost. And sometimes it's very slow. Mm -hmm. I am currently complying my academic research, which will be submitted after the lockdown, but I am struggling a lot. What mm -hmm. would you advise here for someone who's doing uh, an academic project or working for school where they can't actually get out of their homes right now, what would be the best solution for them to complete and meet these deadlines? Um, I'm going to ask... We can have Dr. Elsie to yeah. actually take that. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a tough question. Uh, it, it's a, it actually speaks to the root of the problem, that if you're relying on um, access to information that is not within your means, um, typically you would get that if you're going into a classroom, if, if you're learning. Uh, or being able to engage with others. Um, now, in a case where uh, you're forced to go online and you don't have the ability to go online, you're essentially cut off. And, and this is really the big concern about um, examples that you have shared, but also uh, poor households that don't have connectivity. It means that an entire generation is just locked out. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Elsie. Another comment here from uh, Kirui Roberts, and I'll have um, Papa take this, because he says that I can access internet even though it is expensive with poor networking. So let's talk about, you know, that issue he's raising. We're paying more, but still the connectivity uh, is poor, Papa. Yes, um, I want to address this head on. Um, last mile is a challenge. We have terabytes of submarine cables. I, I, I know you've heard the new one that MTN, Vodafone, and Facebook, everybody's talking about. We have the ACE cable. We're investors in the ACE cable. So, so the, the, raw, the raw capacity is there. But what he's talking about is the last mile solution. And, and that's what I harped on. The quality is a challenge. Because at the end of the day, mobile broadband is still the most popular way of accessing internet around our part of the world. Everybody has a smart, smartphone. But the best way of accessing the internet is the fixed system, whether it's wireless or fiber. And that is a huge reach for our African countries. So I do understand what he's saying, that at this point in time, uh, quality is an issue. So what we advise our customers, because we have to create solutions. So what we tell the customers is, make sure that you have your devices off, because everybody wants to connect to the Wi-Fi. So if the guy is trying to submit assignments, do a Skype call, a WhatsApp call, the idea is to make sure that you have everybody's device off because even if you are not using it, the device is connected, a lot of things are happening in the background. So we advise customers to, to say, look, we know quality might be a challenge. So the way to do that, even in the West, I think you know the likes of Netflix when the lockdown was really severe, everybody was logging on, uh, streaming and all that. Netflix downgraded the type of quality you could get. Because at the end of the day, if the quality was so high, people will have a challenge streaming anything. So this is not just an African problem. It's a global problem because okay. that's the way internet is. No matter how much you give, people still want to do more and you get challenges with quality. Okay, thank you for that, Papa. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings me to my next question, Ian. Yep. While you've been working from home, how has the internet been for you? The internet has been, you know, okay, yesterday I was trying to record a Skype interview and I had to switch from my Wi-Fi uh, onto um, data. But then think about it, Priscilla. So many people would actually like to watch this particular conversation, mm -hmm. but unfortunately they cannot because we're holding it, you know, on Facebook Live. And which also brings us to the kind of inequality when it comes to schools. Maybe mm -hmm. We can have a look at that, Priscilla. Okay, let's have a look at that now. With countries across Africa closing schools to curb the spread of COVID-19, web learning is becoming a widely used tool to make sure children continue learning. Learning at home, our South African correspondent, Vumani Mikhezi, explores exactly this. The country may be on lockdown, but online, the doors of education are still very much wide open. The Lockdown Digital School focuses on STEM subjects, which are science, technology, engineering and maths, and all grades are catered for, ensuring pupils don't fall behind as the academic year continues to be disrupted by the coronavirus. 
So this is essentially education in the time of coronavirus. This is a digital school. Um, it's called the STEM Lockdown Digital School. And uh, learners are able to access valuable teaching uh, resources and, and material online. So over here, we've got the teacher, Arifa Hafiji, who's teaching about 110 learners who are part of this uh, lesson right now. This is a grade eight. We're moving too fast, oh, One of the learners is complaining about the teacher moving too fast. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. They are able to communicate with the teacher in real time. The digital school is the brainchild of Lindiwe Matladi, who runs a coding NGO, Africa Teen Geeks. For Lindiwe, bridging the digital divide is crucial to reducing South Africa's massive inequality gap. So the first thing that I do is I draw my life. But the reality is, many impoverished children won't be able to access this resource. All the kids that are able to access this tool, which is free, are kids who already have. A parents who probably can also just, you know, go and search for lessons anyway and, and give their kids anyway. So, um, you know, as much as, you know, what we are about is saving the disadvantaged, right now we cannot save the disadvantaged because, unfortunately, they do not have the basic necessity for them to access, you know, um, these tools, these services that we are providing for free. The digital school has 54 teachers. Classes start at 8 a.m. and the last one is at 6 p.m. By all intents and purposes, it's a proper school. Last week, over 30,000 learners accessed the platform and even more are expected this week. I also think that we are bringing a bit of normality into this disarray of whatever is going on. Um, and if you start the call, or if you go on a call with the kids, you will see them sitting there with their pencil and their pens and they will tell the teacher, teacher, why didn't you ask us to write? Or teacher, why didn't you give us homework, etc. So um, I believe we're making a big difference and I'm very grateful to be part of it. While e-learning isn't going to fill the gap in the academic year, the lockdown school has found a way to turn a crisis into an opportunity. Vumane Mkize, BBC News, Johannesburg. Not every child in Africa has access to the internet. However, this means that millions of children across the continent are not getting an education during this crisis. Are you facing challenges in learning at the moment if you're pursuing your education right now? That's right. We'd like to know and hear from you as you continue to watch this live broadcast and of course as you talk about this particular issue. And so this is a question to both uh, Dr. Elsie and mm -hmm. Papa. The question we've seen, that is an e-learning school in South Africa. Not every school, not every child across the continent is able to access the internet or continue with their learning. Let's talk about the kind of inequality this brings about, Dr. Elsie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and this, uh, this is a good example of why uh, the African community at large is advocating for um, looking to homegrown solutions and contextual solutions as we think about how we address issues like uh, education for all. So, for example, uh, those born in the digital era, they forget that in, in many parts of Africa, radio is still used as a, as a learning tool. Um, it was used for classrooms, particularly for, for rural access, um, and, and radio is still relevant. And uh, accordingly, uh, we've seen innovations which are, in terms of being able to um, impart learning without using uh, smartphones, for instance, or USSD, there's, there's quite, a few in, quite a few innovations by entrepreneurs where you're in situations where you don't have power all the time. You don't have access to connectivity all the time. Brick solutions, for instance, so innovative ways of providing education um, in hitherto rural areas. So I think if we're able to scale up um, these ways of, of bridging the gap, uh, there is a track record in terms of existing solutions. What COVID has done is to speed up the process of ensuring that more people are able to get access and not to accept a situation where we have education for a few and not education for all. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Kanza. Now, Papa, when it comes to higher education, university students may have access to smartphones, but now what the problem is, is the cost of internet. Is there a solution for this? <laughs> uh, certainly, there, 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 there are so many solutions out there. I mean, we're businessmen also, and we continually try to uh, lobby our governments and engage them to say that if the incentives are there, you know, we will see costs reduced. And, and as I'm speaking to you, I think 
That is what is going on in most African countries, whereby the government is giving tax holidays, you know, zero duty on equipment, because that, that is the most expensive part of setting up the networks. It is the equipment. So if taxes and, and monopolies are, are, are out of the way, it means that costs can come down. But I will be honest with you, uh, as doctor has mentioned, you have other factors that are not in your control. For example, the cost of electricity. In some of our countries, electricity costs are so high. And if an operator has to factor in the, 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 the technology costs, the cost of power, the cost of infrastructure, it means that it's a tall order for the average person to afford. So I always advocate that we will bring in the submarine cables, but we need the public-private partnerships to make sure that the people down below get what they, what, what they need to get, especially the students. We have that situation in the country. For example, some of the students cannot afford to be online all the time. So what they do is WhatsApp learning. It means they do the voice notes, and that is sent across. You don't need to have connectivity all the time. But to answer your question, quite clearly, we know there's a cost issue. And I'm of the opinion that the internet 10 years ago is, is a lot cheaper today because of some of these things that are happening. And of course, a lot more needs to be done, as I just alluded to. Now, a lot more needs to be done, as Papa says. There. Now, it's, just, it's not just parents uh, that have had to adjust to this new normal. We spoke to the people around Africa who have had to work from home, and this is what they had to say. The biggest difficulty that I have sometimes, connectivity. And the biggest problem with that connectivity is the fact that everyone is at home is clogged. Connectivity that I've been given by internet service providers is not even enough. And sometimes I had to upgrade. I personally have two connections at home. I mean, just two connections at home. But the thing is, sometimes I still have a hotspot because of redundancy. In a time where mobile penetration and inter internet penetration because of mobile data is at an all-time high in Kenya, I believe that many Kenyans have been able to at least be connected to some degree and be able to utilize their data to either work or to receive news or you know just stay connected to their friends and family. So I think it's at a time where we're seeing uh, and reaping the benefits of having good mobile networks in the country and having uh, high internet access. Now, Priscilla, how has been how has your experience been, you know, working from home since actually this is the first time I'm seeing you in about two months? <laughs> well, uh, lucky for me, I do have great internet access and it's something that I can afford. Um, I'd say there's a bit of trouble sometimes when the internet cuts in and out, especially when you're doing bulletins and you need to deliver something at a certain time. Yeah. So it's been quite tricky, but I'm I'm very grateful that it has it has been working so far. Okay, thank you for that. Now, Dr. Elsie and Papa, this is also a question of matters of policy. Let's talk about internet shutdowns, for instance. We've seen this being experienced in countries like Ethiopia, and I'm seeing some of the comments actually uh, mentioning this as a challenge. How can we avoid this as a continent, Dr. Elsie? Uh, thank you. That's a, it's a very important challenge. Um, and if I, if I may refer back to the Internet for All initiative that, that I highlighted, um, that we at the forum have been uh, working on with multi-stakeholders over the past four years or so, uh, a big part of that advocacy is, um, is really uh, enlightening policymakers and society at large that access to the Internet is not a luxury. It's very basic, right? It's basic for everything, basic for health access, basic for education access, basic for running businesses uh, even. And it was being treated as a luxury for those that could afford it. Um, last week, we had a, a consultative meeting uh, with Alibaba eFounder fellows who were sharing their plight during this uh, COVID crisis. And they said COVID has actually been a blessing in disguise. Right. And, uh, it's, uh, and this is because they say issues that they were debating and, and, and arguing and discussing and negotiating with the policymakers have become redundant in two months. They've seen their businesses grow fivefold, sevenfold and policymakers changing and fast tracking uh, interventions overnight, so to speak, because hitherto they had said Africa is not ready for this. We're not, you know, this may be five years down the road. And so COVID has, has made everyone realize really being digital is not a luxury. Okay, Papa, maybe you can take that same question because this is, uh, this is of, of concern, especially from, uh, you know, those of us watching from Ethiopia. I'm seeing that comment as well. Yes, you can mention Ethiopia. I mean, shutdowns in Cameroon, Egypt, 
I mean, I have personal experience in the old regime in the Gambia uh, where a dictatorship was present. You know, we were subject to uh, internet shutdowns um, 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 and, and many other ways of uh, policing the internet. So my, my opinion, having gone through some of these things, I'm like, uh, the regulators and the government should be focused on access as a human right. We've seen how uh, penetration rates compared to GDP has, uh, has, has, has clearly showed that where countries have high penetration rates, economies flourish. So I see the internet as a basic human right, as doctor has said. And I'm of the opinion that the policies should be governed towards freeing up the space. Yes, everybody has to make sure that they follow the rules and regulations, but you don't do social media taxes and shutdowns and things of that sort on the internet. The African population is, the average age is 15 to 30 years. So you have a lot of young people exposed, and the internet is, is their gateway to the rest of the world. I always say it, 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 is, it is your passport without a visa. So I'm of, the, I'm of the opinion that, as doctor has mentioned, our focus should be not policing the internet. We've lived through it, and we've seen the difference in a democratic government giving access to everybody who wants it in a responsible way against the internet shutdowns and things of that sort. So if it's a basic human right, I want to believe that our laws and policies should promote against uh, some of what we're seeing around our continent. It, it's, it surely doesn't bode in well for investors to invest millions of dollars and not be able to recoup your investment by policies that go against uh, what, what you've invested in. Thank shooting you. Shooting prices and things of that sort. Thank, Thank you. you for that, Papa. We have loads of different perspectives coming in through comments from Facebook Live. We also have a comment from Jeffrey Mugi, who has said e-learning is for the elites. The masses are languishing in poverty. Putting food on the table comes first, then these are the luxuries. Mm -hmm. Education to most African learners shall resume once normality returns. Dr. Elsie, any comment on that? Mm -hmm. Huh. It, it, it raises a, an important issue that we saw emerge uh, with, the, with the lockdowns and, and quarantining of various kinds, which was the disruptions to uh, food supply chains, uh, essentially beginning with, with farmers uh, having food that could not get to markets and going to waste, uh, with the disruptions to outdoor markets, groceries being shut, uh, for a period, restaurants, cafes being closed. Um, you had school feeding programs and, and children not able to get access to nutrition. So I, I agree that that is a, is a critical concern. Uh, you cannot sleep hungry. It's very difficult. Even if uh, you may skip learning for a day, uh, skipping food uh, is different. At the same time, I personally do not see it as an either or. Both are, are critical and um, also livelihoods, right? You, you, you need an income, ultimately. Uh, the internet access we're talking about, just to echo uh, my, uh, my fellow speaker, is that businesses also need, need to operate. Um, and, and how do we do both, right? Use this as an opportunity to foster more livelihoods by coming up with solutions um, to these very basic problems um, that our uh, that our our participants uh, are raising, um, how do we move forward um, holistically? Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Elsie Kanza is the head of the regional agenda at the World Economic Forum. We're also joined by Papa Yusufa Njaya, who is the founder and CEO of Unique Groups. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elsie, and of course, Papa, for giving us your sentiments. And of course, a lot of you have been sending in your sentiments, and majority of you are concerned about the uh, cost of data. And you're also wondering, during this pandemic, why should the internet be um, of concern to me. And of course, we'll keep on looking at some of your feedback and uh, try to get back to you on some of what you have been raising. My name is Ian Wafula. And my name is Priscilla Nyade. Thank you.